morning and welcome as we gather together for our Sunday get-together. And as we prepare our hearts and minds, let us go to God in prayer. Holy God, we ask for your help and your power and your spirit so that we can amend our lives and grow more each day into the image of Christ. We confess that we fear what is different We confess that it's easier to lock the doors of our community than to receive those who don't look like we look, love like we love, or vote the way we vote. We confess that we have not lived out your call to share in abundant life and unconditional love. We believe that you have the power to turn us around to a more inclusive way of living. So we ask you to do that. We ask you to give us the courage to change. We ask that you give us the energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to be your people in all we say and do. We lift up all of these things as we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's affirmation of faith is a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God, where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he lived and died to buy my pardon an empty grave is there to prove Savior lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I is 
At this time, as we gather together, let us take a few moments and to remember names and situations that we lift up with our joys and concerns. And we will have a brief moment of silent prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Today's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One semester at a university I will not name, a student began walking around the campus in the nude. Eventually, he was arrested and sent home. A university spokesperson said, yes, we can use free expression, but first and foremost, we are a place of higher education. Over the years, I've met my share of weirdos, but none of them ever came to class undressed. Although at once, it was once allowed to walk around naked and unashamed. Now, of course, I'm speaking of Eden's first pair who walked through the garden until late that first afternoon when God arrived and our beloved twosome both hid from God's sight and covered themselves. Something about this fast, deteriorating situation no longer seemed as sweet and innocent as it had before lunch when Eve said, how about a nice apple cobbler for dessert, my dear? And Adam said, it would be sinful, sweet Eve, lip-smackingly sinful. In the Bible, being naked has more to do with being caught dead to rights than being caught with nothing in our closet. The story is about sin. How easy to commit, how hard to deny. One father said that his most vivid memory of raising children was when one of his offspring came running into the study and announced, I didn't do anything bad in the dining room. Which led the father to ask the child, and what bad thing in the dining room didn't you do? all of which led this wise father to observe that God must every now and then feel like asking us would be innocent children, and precisely, what bad thing is it, my children, that you didn't do? How is it that so many terrible things keep happening in the room next door, yet nobody seems to know how or why, or who did them? That is the paradox of human existence. Professing the best does not always keep us from performing at our worst. One of the reasons we appear naked before God in the late afternoon is that when we go to our closets, there are skeletons hanging where our clothes should be. Over the years, these skeletons keep multiplying because over time our sins reproduce. Sin begets sin and it is the building of corruption. A seventh grade boy steals a classmate's iPod. When confronted, he lies about the theft. Who, me? I didn't steal an iPod. 
When the iPod is found in his locker, he lies about the motive. I just wanted to see the different screensavers. When his motive is challenged, he lies about the lie. I am telling you the truth. What kind of teacher are you if you didn't even believe a kid who tells the truth? When he is punished, he lets the air out of his teacher's tires and beats up the safety patrol kid who catches him kneeling beside the teacher's wheel. As one doctor explains, youngsters soon discover what the wise have known for years. People rarely commit single sins which leads to the fear that as our moral mess-ups add up, their collective weight will drag us down. What if we posted sins on the refrigerator door? After all, we put everything else there. What if in our growing up years, every defection, indiscretion, omission, or fall from grace was printed on a little yellow sticky note and attached to the refrigerator. Billy's sins for Wednesday. Forgot to feed cat. Kick cat. Left milk glass in family room. Blew off math assignment. Was overheard using four-letter word as a descriptive adjective for his sister. And if that wasn't bad enough, what if Thursday's sins were written out and attached to the bottom of the list from Wednesday? And what if Friday had its own list? Before too long, there would be yellow sticky notes all over the refrigerator with the paper trail of Billy's sinfulness doubled back against itself for all the world to see. And how many weeks would it take before Billy's sins would expand to cover the walls and the ceilings, the cabinet doors, the closet where the canned goods are kept? Pretty soon, Billy wouldn't want to come into the kitchen anymore and would take to eating most of his meals out. Make no mistake about it. When Paul talks about the weight of sin, he is talking about Billy, the growing burden of Billy's record. What if it all piles up? What if none of it ever gets unstuck from the doors, walls, closets, of Billy's life? What if it all stays there and screams at him day after day in a bitter chorus of condemnation? It is scary to think how much is remembered and recorded and posted on the refrigerator or pinned to the parts of our reputation. For good or bad, most of us go through life dragging our sin behind us. And even if we escape the weight of sin individually, we carry the burden of it culturally. What if none of it ever gets put to rest? What if the sins of the fathers and the grandfathers, not to mention the forefathers, keep reappearing every generation? What if we have to keep making payments over and over again for sins committed centuries ago? What if all of this agony piles up so that our children's children have to keep suffering for atoning, for hurting and dying for this mounting mound of moral stuff gone bad? What sense can we make out of all this tangled and troubled history? What will we do with the record of wrongs that is written on the refrigerator doors, numbered in the chronicles of history and kept alive in the collective memories of families and tribes and nations? Will we ever get the problem fixed? The pinnacle paid, the record expunged, the leftover eyes and teeth sorted out, the slate wiped clean. Or does it just get wider and deeper and more burdensome by the day? I can hear the prayer now. Oh, for a means by which to wash it away. This is exactly what our faith offers a means by which to wash it away. Our sins don't have to keep piling up and getting higher and higher, deeper and deeper, greater and greater in number. 
hanging like paper chains across the walls and ceilings of our kitchens or spilling into the third and fourth generations of our children's children. Our sins don't have to follow us to graduation day, dying day, or even judgment day, nor do they have to cling to us like barnacles on a boat's bottom, burrs on a plant or on a pant leg, or gravy stains on a tie. Our sins can be washed away. The waters of baptism, the cup of communion, or the blood of the cross can wash them away. Imagery. Of course, it is imagery. But graceful imagery is always liquid imagery. Picture God's mercy trickling on down, washing on down, or even flooding on down. Or if you don't like that, picture the rain that falls on the just and the unjust. But remember that rain, biblically considered, is never considered to be a curse or an inconvenience, but a blessing and sign of grace. Or, if you don't like that, picture in the words of a beloved spiritual peace like a river, love like an ocean, or joy like a fountain in your soul. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, what is
Thank you for joining us today, and as we get ready to go our separate ways, let us go to God in prayer. Today, brothers and sisters, travelers on the journey of faith, pay attention. God is at work all around us. May we go ready to witness the signs of God's love in our midst and to be a sign of God's love wherever we go. Amen.